Hi everyone, today I'm doing a video special on theory crafting on card design. This is not something I do very often given my limited expertise in the area, but I thought I'd just drop my two pennies here because this is an issue that the design team of Netrunner has not managed to conquer time and time again. And that's none other than the Wayland Advanceable Ice. Now if you haven't done so, you should check out Devedus' Uh, post on why Wayland is a weak faction. In his part 1 of his article, he covers the advanceable eyes and gives a pretty lengthy description and some solutions on these advanceable eyes. It is in fact his article that inspired me to think about this, this issue. So let's review the advanceable eyes that Wayland has right now. Wayland, of all Wayland eyes printed so far, I think half of them, roughly, are advanceable eyes. And so this is why you hear a lot of people say that Wayland Ice suck, because the Advanceable Ice Suite has time and time again failed to meet the power curve, leaving Wayland with very few op infection options to shore up their defenses. The four main kinds of Wayland uh, Advanceable Ice are as follows on the screen, listed in chronological order. Advancement counters give extra strength, extra subroutines, change the type of the ice, or reduce the rest cost of the ice. So it's a pretty good variety. But a lot of them don't even see the light of day on the table, not to mention in high level competitive play. Why is this so? Is the solution as simple as tweaking numbers, adjusting them to fit nearer to the power curve? It's not that straightforward, I think, and I'm going to explain why. But first, let's look at the earlier iterations of Advanceable Ice. The plus strength and the plus sub ice. Uh, I'm just using Ice Wall and Tyrant as examples here, but uh, really you can substitute them with uh, whatever you want, Hadrian's Wall or Woodcutter, etc. Whichever ice you choose to look at, they all fall into the same trap. They either work so well as to be uh, overwhelmingly powerful and unsurmountable as the runner, or completely dead. Let me give you an example. For the plus strength ice, if the runner has any way to deal with high strength single set routine eyes like Femme or David, all your effort has just got, gone down the drain. Imagine if you spend two whole turns advancing the ice wall or firewall only to have it Davided away, only to have it Femmed. That is a very heartbreaking feeling and that is not something uh, that you can recover from. Losing two whole turns to a single breaker by the runner. On the other hand, if the runner doesn't run such a breaker, suddenly they are facing a 10 plus strength barrier that they can never get past. That is the other end of the spectrum. Insurmountable, too powerful. You can say the same for plus subroutine ice, except that they have different weaknesses this time. Instead of Fem and David, they are weak to ice destruction, and they are weak to ice breakers that break all subroutines, regardless of the number of subroutines. And this is not a fault of the runner side card design. It is great that runners have a variety of tools to deal with ice, not just static uh, fractals, decoders, and killers. That would make the game very boring. We must have stuff like ice destruction, de-resing, and bypassing. However, these make advanceable ice very difficult to design because, as I said, um, they'll either be too powerful or completely underwhelming. And it is the former. The threat of such ice potentially being too powerful that forces the developers to bring them very far below the power curve. That's why you have ice like Tyrant, with, which is very expensive and clunky even against decks that don't run any ice destruction at all. And against decks that do, it's just a completely dead piece of ice. Moving on now to the newer ice, those released in the latest two cycles, we have the Morph Ice and the reduced rest cost ice. These are actually playable. You actually see some decks pack changeling as a response to uh, mimic only decks, like uh, in the good old prepaid Kate days, where oh, prepaid Kate only ran mimic. Wormhole is a pretty decent code gate, considering that it's in the Wayland faction. On the flip side, the des designers have also printed some cards that are way below the power level. Lycan is clearly too weak. I mean, 3 strength for 6 res is just terrible. And Asteroid Belt it has okay stats, but it was released at worst possible time. One where prepaid case with Cerberus Lady and Anarch decks with David run rampant around the place, making Asteroid Belt a pretty awful choice. But 
all in all, they are still closer to the power curve and more importantly, much better designed than the, in the earlier eyes, which are plus strength and plus sub eyes. Now I want you to take a moment and think of why I say this. Why do I say that they are better designed? What do the latter two eyes uh, have in common that the former two eyes do not? Well, if you notice, there is actually an upper limit on the number of advancement tokens needed to achieve max maximum efficiency on the morph eyes and the minus rest cost eyes. Whereas for the plus strength and the plus sub eyes, there is no upper limit. You can go up to infinite strength or infinite subroutines. And I think this is the fundamental design problem with the earlier iterations of advanceable eyes that make it so difficult to design them in a balanced and proper way. Let me illustrate this example by looking at Asteroid Belt, which maxes out at 3 advancement tokens, costing 0 to res instead of 9. What if there was no such limit? What if you could reduce its rest cost below zero? Meaning that if it had a negative rest cost when you rest the eyes, you would actually gain that number of credits instead. So imagine this make-believe world. Wouldn't Asteroid Belt be pretty crazy? Wouldn't the entire space ice suite be crazy? You wouldn't need to run any other economy cards in the deck anymore. Just advance your space ice and wait for the runner to run into it, or res it yourself with Executive Boot Camp. So long as the core player is offered the opportunity to convert one of their clicks into two credits, as you can see from the equation from the left, as long as they are given the chance to do so, they have no reason not to. It's as efficient as a magnum opus or a capital investors without the need to actually create a secure remote to protect the capital investors. This constitutes a fundamental design problem. It is fundamental because you cannot solve the problem by simply tweaking the numbers. As it is, each advancement counter gains the run the core three credits. If you reduce this gain of three, this ice will become unplayable. There is a very fine line between worth advancing and not worth advancing. And once you're on either side, the ice either becomes broken or completely unplayable. With the limit that the rest cost of an ice cannot go below zero, you are now able to offer a very good exchange rate, one advancement counter for three credits without breaking the game, without the corp abusing it by clicking it every single turn. So that's good design. The next question that follows, how can we apply this good design to the cards in need of it? Your firewall, your tyrant, your salvage. Well, let's look at the plus strength ice first. Um, ice wall, for example. Ice wall is the only one of the plus strength and plus subroutine ice that is even remotely playable in uh, Wayland decks because even after 25 data packs and 4 deluxe expansions, it still remains as the cheapest gear check for a fractal. And that really is the main use of Ice Wall. You almost never see anyone advance an Ice Wall outside of Trick of Light decks. Which is a fundamental problem. No one is using Ice Wall for its benefit. And why is that? Well, to start things off, it is already very far below the power curve. Usually you expect plus one strength on an ice to be worth one extra res cost. Co just compare firewall with ice wall, both of which have the same res cost and strength. Yet for ice wall to reach the five strength that firewall is, it requires four credits from the four advancements in addition to the four clicks you spend advancing it. That is such a tough sell. It is highly inefficient and that traces back to conservative design because the developers are worried that if it were any higher, the strength gain were any higher, you could potentially lock out a runner very easily. And that was not desirable. So what do we do? We fix the fundamental problem. Cap the number of advancement counters that can affect the strength of ice wall. As printed here, what if only three advancement counters will count towards the plus strength? This allows us more wiggle room to uh, play around with the plus strength. We can give plus 2 strength for each advancement counter instead of plus 1. So now at maximum, Ice Wall is a 6 strength barrier that costs 4 credits and 3 clicks to fully advance. And voila! You now have an Ice that is actually worth advancing. The astute amongst you might have realized that this is almost exactly the same 
resource cost as Asteroid Belt, which requires 3 clicks and 3 credits to achieve the same 6 strength and the run barrier. So this is actually slightly worse because it costs 1 extra credit, but bear in mind that um, it can act as an end run binary uh, gear check ice, whereas Asteroid Belt cannot until it's fully advanced. This also allows you to explore the other part of Advanceable Ice design space, one that a lot of people lament, which is the clause that it can only be advanced while rest. With such an ice design, you can now make it you can now include this clause, perhaps bump up its strength by one to compensate for it, and it'll work perfectly fine. This is an idea borrowed from Devedas in his article, where he suggested that only advanceable while rest ice should have a single subroutine to begin with. Otherwise, letting the runner through on the first res is horrible. Why would you ever let a runner through with your zero subroutine ice? That's just completely crap. And I agree. This version of Ice Wall could foreseeably be only advanceable while rest and still be pretty decent. You would still res it, want to res it, and it would still end the run when the runner first encounters it, but you can evolve it once you have the resources to do so. And I think this is a very beautiful aspect of the design space that sadly is unexplored right now because of the underwhelmingness of Advanceable Ice. The ability to evolve your own ice. I've always dreamed of an HB card that evolves your 1.0 ice to 2.0, <laughs> but I guess that's a way off. Wayland is the faction where your ice evolves. You can clearly see that from the infection cards like Patch and the Advanceable Ice. And to fully make use of this design space must make it such that the player feels empowered. They feel like they have the option to evolve their ice and that this option is actually meaningful and impactful to the game. And this is why I deliberately made it such that each advancement counter gives two strength instead of the usual one strength. This is a very important aspect. And here's another example, this time with Tyrant, the plus subroutine ice. Instead of gaining one subroutine per advancement counters, I'm going to make it such that you it maxes out at two advancement counters, and when you reach that max out point, it gains three subroutines at one go. So this is more efficient than the one is to one trade that was in the past. But more importantly, it gives the core player an option to really empower themselves, give three more subroutines to their ice, make it that much harder for the runner to come in. And make it such that in the worst case scenario, where the runner is running a card like Sherman or uh, Parasite, they can choose not to advance it. At that point, it would just be a slightly overcosted barrier, just like Changeling 544. That's okay. By putting an upper bound to the potential power level and setting a minimum to the worst case scenario, the card becomes a lot more playable. Players will no longer feel like they have dead weight in the decks. And more importantly, as the designer, you can much more easily control the power level of the card, keep it from going too out of hand. All in all, I feel that Advanceable Ice definitely isn't a dead end. I definitely think that it's a de design space that's worth exploring, but instead of trying to salvage the terrible design of cards such as, well, salvage, with silly cards such as Dedication Ceremony, the designer should strive to print better advanceable ice that empowers the player rather than creating polarizing cards that either are a complete flop or can be completely broken. I do sincerely hope that the designers have realized this fundamental problem and are in the midst of printing better advanceable ice for the future, a future where I can look back on this video and confidently say that my prediction was correct, that this was the underlying design flaw all along. Do you agree with me? Do you feel that there are other ways in which the design of Advanceable Eyes can be improved? Leave your comments in the comment section. In the meantime, thanks for watching, happy net running, goodbye.